Hello, welcome to chapter 22, Evolution by Natural Selection. So, by the end of this chapter, you should be able to contrast typological thinking with Lamarckian evolution and Darwinian evolution. You should be able to describe numerous kinds of evidence that we use to support the theory of evolution. Um, you should be able to define terms like evolution, fitness, population, adaptation, using the biological definitions that we will be using in this course. We will also talk about Darwin's four postulates of natural selection and apply them to a scenario, so you should be able to tell me about that. And we're also going to go through common misconceptions about evolution, and we will use different kinds of evidence to explain why these misconceptions are inaccurate. So this is a pretty long chapter, and if we were meeting in person, I would use two different lecture periods to cover this material. So what I'm going to do is, in this recording, I will cover about half of these learning objectives, and then in part two, I'll get the other half. Okay, so as a rough introduction, evolution by natural selection is one of the best supported and most important theories in modern biology. And so if you go back to chapter one of your textbook, um, your book talked about key attributes of life, right? And so one of the five key attributes of life is that populations of organisms evolve or change over time. And so evolution by natural selection is essential to that component of being alive. In addition to this, it is an organizing principle of the way that we study biology. So all disciplines of biology, whether you're studying ecology um, or, organism, or organismal diversity, or physiology, or anatomy, or molecular biology, all of these components of biology use evolution by natural selection as an organizing principle. All right, so a little history. In the time that Darwin was alive, biological diversity, and when I say biological diversity, I mean like, um, you know, all of the different kinds of life that you see around you, you know, all the different species and things like that. That was explained by the theory of special creation. And the theory of special creation said that all species are independent, meaning that none of them are the ancestors of any of the other ones of them. They are all completely separate from one another. Another component of special creation was the idea that life on Earth is young, thousands of years old. And then finally, that species cannot change. So, you know, species are the same as they have ever been so long as they've ever been on Earth. And so Darwin's On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection was published in 1859. And one of the main things that this book did was challenge assumptions about ideas of special creation. So we'll go into more details of that in a little bit. All right. Um, so throughout the lectures, I will, I'll provide you guys with the purple slides and then we will periodically stop and introduce some questions. And so um, these are on red slides. Normally I would do this for you guys as a class. Some of these questions I will have the opportunity to talk to you guys about when we meet for participation um, on Wednesdays. But some of these are just kind of, you know, to break things up a little bit. Um, so what is a scientific theory anyway? Anyone? Anyone? Dog? Do you know what a scientific theory is? Yeah, I guess I kind of do. It's like, it's like an idea that has lots of evidence behind it. Um, sort of, yeah. We're going to get more into that in a little bit, but yeah, that's a good start, right? It's something that's supported by evidence. Uh, anyone else want to add to that? Yeah. Well, like, it's really a strong idea. Yeah. All right. Good job, Kat. Okay. So the way that we define a theory in this class, a scientific theory, is that it is different than a guess, right? Um, it's not a guess. It is something that is strongly supported, um, and it is also reasonably broad. It's an idea that's broad enough to explain a wide class of observations, okay? So if you have, it's like a, not just a little idea, but a big idea that can explain many, many things that you see in the world around you, and also, it has to be supported broadly by lots and lots of evidence, okay? So this is, we talked about this in 1113 quite a bit, but this is one of the differences between a theory and a hypothesis, right? A hypothesis can be supported by a single study, but a theory is going to be supported by many, 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 many studies. Okay, so um, theories, scientific theories, are often comprised of two different components, pattern and process. Okay, so your book is going to come back to pattern and process a lot, 
So let's make sure we understand what it means. So a pattern, right? So you, it's something you see. Um, so you see a pattern, right? It's an observation about the natural world. Like, I don't know, why is it that, that I can't think of any things at all? Why do birds call? Okay, that's a pattern. Um, a process is a mechanism that produces that pattern. So a process is some reason um, why you get that pattern in nature, right? So the mechanism, for example, for why are birds calling would be that um, the calling causes females to mate with the males, okay? So pattern and process. Okay, so we'll come back to pattern and thoughts process in a little bit, but let's start ab about thinking about the evolution of evolutionary thought, okay? So change in time over the way we think about change over time. Um, so the theory of evolution by natural selection is often described as revolutionary. Um, so it's something that um, <clears throat> replaces an existing idea about nature with a radically different idea. So if you look at the history of science, you find all these different revolutionary ideas um, since people have started to think scientifically in which we replace some idea with some radically different idea. Um, so the idea of special creation really had a strong hold over Western thought and people thought about organisms as having appeared by special creation for over 2,000 years. So it was a real challenge um, for Darwin to get anyone to listen to his ideas because these ideas about special creation were so entrenched. And so we'll talk a little bit in a few minutes about, you can even see ways in which special creation ideas kind of creep into our language, but I'll get into that in a bit. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so um, one component of some of the early thinking about the diversity of life involved typological thinking, okay? And so this is a, a kind of a thinking about organisms that can be illustrated by the works of the Greek philosopher Plato. So Greek, the Greek philosopher Plato wrote that every organism was an example of a perfect essence or type created by God. Um, and so the types were essentially unchanging, okay? So each organism, um, you know, so this kind of this, a horse is a perfect kind of a horse, um, and horses are always horses. Horses never become something else. Okay, so the typological thinking means is referring to the type, right? The perfect type that's created by God, um, and maybe there's some vari variation among individuals because they're I don't know a little broken or something like that. I don't know. All right, um, a little bit later, Aristotle took the kind of pre the current idea about these essences or fixed types and took it one step further. He created what's called the great chain of being. So his philosophy was that these fixed types of species were organized into a sequence based on increasing size and complexity. So he had this chain where you had things that he considered lower like minerals and plants way down at the bottom of this chain and then humans at the top of the chain and he had organized all forms of life like maybe you got a nematode here and then a fish and then I don't know if that's supposed to be a short-necked horse or a tapir. It's whatever you want it to be. Um, and so Aristotle's ideas persisted into the 1700s, and you can see evidence of these ideas even now, even though we know that this isn't either, this isn't the mechanism that causes life to be different on Earth. Um, but when we talk about higher forms of life and lower forms of life, right? This is based around the idea of Aristotle's great chain of being. Um, we know now, of course, that, like, I mean, we can get taken out by bacteria or a virus, right? So who's higher and who's lower anyway? Um, but the idea that you have higher and lower life forms comes from this chain of being. Okay. Um, and another kind of um, uh, step in our history of understanding evolution came from Lamarck. So Lamarck was a French biologist, and he was the first person to pose a formal theory of evolution. So the idea of evolution is biological change over time, right? Um, so Lamarck thought that evolution was progressive. And so you would start out with things that were simple and small, and they would evolve into things that were larger, more complex, or better over time. Okay, so he took on the idea of the, you know, this kind of ladder, the chain of life, and he thought that rather than each of the rungs of the ladder being fixed and staying the same, that you would get, you know, simple organisms that would eventually over time evolve into more complex ones, which would evolve into more complex ones and more complex ones, okay? And if you're wondering how does stuff get onto this ladder in the first place, well, Lamarck thought that this happened 
by the idea of spontaneous generation, which um, this was kind of a popular idea that you can make living things out of nothing. And um, so, for example, uh, one of they, there was this um, book that I think we have kicking around our house of recipes of spontaneous generation in which um, it's kind of a medieval book. People thought, oh, if you want to make mice, then you need to put a bucket outside of your front step and put like laundry and seeds in it and stuff like that. And then, you know, leave it there for three weeks and then it'll have mice in it. And I mean, I bet if you did that, you would get mice in a bucket. But obviously this isn't by spontaneous generation. They didn't come out of thin air. They came out of other mice that put them there. Okay. Um, Lamarck also believed in evolution by inheritance of acquired characters. So this is something that uh, we, well, we don't believe very much now, but we'll get more into that later. So the idea is that an individual's phenotype changes in response to environmental changes. Okay. Um, and so this would be like, you know, if you worked out, um, you know, every single day and you had big giant muscles and a big old neck or whatever, then you would have offspring with big muscles and a big old neck, right? They would somehow inherit this environmental change that you've experienced. Um, so the uh, inheritance of acquired characters is basically that phenotypic changes. Hey, you guys, what's a phenotype? Oh, yeah, I know what a phenotype is. Uh, what is a bird? A phenotype is like how you look and how your genes are expressed. Yeah, okay, that's a phenotype, right. So the idea that phenotypic changes, like big muscles, would be passed on to your offspring. So one of um, Lamarck's classic examples of this is that giraffes will develop long necks because they spend their whole lives stretching to reach food, and that striving for food gives um, their offspring long necks too. Wait! What? What about epigenetics? What about epigenetics? Like, if you, isn't there like methylation that can be inherited after if like you're in like a terrible famine or war and then your offspring get methylated DNA that affects them? Well, I, yes, dog, I don't know how a dog would know that, but yes, some of Lamarck's ideas have been found to be a little bit true. Um, we do know that sometimes some kinds of phenotypic changes, especially really, um, you know, having a, being like alive during wartime or living a life of <clears throat> extreme stress can sometimes cause a response that's inherited by offspring. Um, did you talk, did you hear about that from Biology 1113, Doug? Yes, I did. Okay. All right, so let's um, give you guys a chance to describe the differences between Lamarckian evolution, <coughs> excuse me, and Aristotle and Plato's typological thinking. So what's one difference? Oh, I know. One of the differences is that Aristotle and Plato thought that species never changed. Yeah, that's true. And what did Lamarck think? The species, they change in over time from simple to complicated. Yep, that's one difference. Um, let's see. What's, uh, what's the difference between Aristotle and Plato's typological thinking? Oh, it's the latter. That's whether there's a latter or whether they're just separate. Right. All right. Any other differences? Just like changing versus not changing. Well, yeah, I think we said that one. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, let's talk a little bit about Darwin and also Russell Wallace and their ideas of evolution by natural selection. So um, we know that species do change over time, right? Uh, we can see evidence of that, that if we look at, at, you know, examples of species from the past, they may be different than they are now. But another thing that we know is that they don't follow a linear progressive pattern, okay? And we'll get more into that later. Um, and one important component for change to occur is that there has to, has to be variation among individuals in the population. So what do we mean by a population? So a population is a group that consists of individuals of the same species living in the same area at the same time. All right, you guys, tell me. Same species, different species? Same species. All right, same area or different area? Same area. All right, same time or different time? 
You know the answer. It's the same time. Okay, yes. So that's a population, okay? So individuals in that population are going to vary in their phenotypes, right? Some will be taller and some will be shorter. Some will be faster and some will be slower, right? Okay. So those variations amongst the individuals in the population um, can cause changes, right? So individuals that have particular traits that allow them to produce more offspring than other individuals without those traits, right? So if you're faster, maybe you won't get eaten and maybe you'll have more babies, right? Okay. All right, let's talk about why the theory of evolution by natural selection was revolutionary. So first, it overturned the idea that species are static. What's static mean? It means they don't change. Right. Static is they say the same and unchanging. Second, um, evolution by natural selection replaced typological thinking with population thinking. Okay, we're going to get more into what population thinking is in a minute, but what is a population? It's a group of individuals living at the same time. Yeah. And what else? Same species. Yeah, same species. What else? Same time, same species. What, which one are we missing? Oh, well, I know. It's the same place. Yeah. All right. The third thing is that the theory of evolution by natural selection was a scientific theory. It proposed a mechanism that could account for the change over time, and its predictions could be tested through observation and experimentation. Okay? Okay. Okay. All right, so Darwin described evolution as descent with modification. So descent meaning from an ancestor to its descendant with modification, right? The descendant is changed compared to the ancestor. So change over time produced modern modified species from the ancestral species. And the pattern, remember we talked about pattern and process, right? So the pattern component of the theory of evolution by natural selection predicts, so by the way, maybe let's make sure we remember, what's the pattern part? Oh, that's the observations that you see. Yeah, pattern is observations. Okay, so here's the observations. Um, the observations you should see is that are that species change through time. That's the first one. And the second thing you should see is that species are going to be related by common ancestry. Okay, so those are the two observed patterns you can see in nature. All right, now we're going to go through a series of pieces of evidence for change through time, okay? So the first piece um, involves the fossil record. So a fossil is just a trace of an organism, organism that lived in the past. So if you look at areas in which you have layers upon layers of sedimentary rock, the youngest layers of sedimentary rock are deposited on top of the older layers, okay? So these are the younger layers, and then way down at the bottom are the older layers. And so scientists can use the fossil's relative positions in the layers of sedimentary rock to create a geological time scale. So for example, if you look up at the top here, we might find these little footprints of a mammal-like reptile, right? Oh, that's adorable. Yeah, kind of cute little feet. All right, a little bit lower we see a fern, okay? And that would be a layer that's about 280 million years old. Way down at the bottom, we see a trilobite, right? 510 years old, so very old. And so one thing that we find, um, and I'll talk about how we know this, but we're able to find out that the Earth is much, much older than the 6,000 years that it was predicted to be based on the idea of special creation. Um, another thing I will point out is we see things that have little footies like this now, right? Yeah, I got little footies like that. Yeah. Um, we see ferns, but if you go too far in the past, we don't see trilobites anymore, right? The farther we go in the past, the less things look familiar to us. Okay, how do we know how old the fossils are? Well, we can use the radioactive decay of molecules to assign an absolute age to events in the geological time scale. Um, what we mean by absolute age is like compared to, if we look at the layers, we can determine the relative age of each thing compared to each other, but absolute just gives us a particular um, number of years old something is. So basically we start out with unstable parent atoms um, that are basically in the organism at the time that it's alive and they get gradually converted into stable daughter atoms. And we can look at a rock and see from the time that this rock was created the ratio of parent to daughter atoms to determine when that rock was made. 
So we can use this radiometric dating to know something. So we can tell that the Earth is about 4.6 billion years old. And we can also go back and see that the earliest signs of life are in rocks that are approximately 3.4 to 3.8 billion years old. Okay, we know that many fossils represent species that no longer exist. Hey, do you guys ever see one of these around? Oh my god, no. I would run away. You should run away. These things are like 12 feet tall. Ah! Okay. Um, this is a giant sloth. We don't, I don't, I, I think we may have had them in the Midwest. We definitely had them all over California. Every museum has like 15 giant sloths in it. They were all over the place. Um, you could just basically, if you were standing here, you'd be like this tall. Me? No, a human. A human would be about this tall. Um, and we don't see these now, right? So the fact that there exist bones of things and these things don't exist on Earth now um, provide us evidence that species are dynamic, meaning here today, gone tomorrow. And also that species living on Earth have changed through time, right? So we don't have anything that looks like this right now. Also, over 99% of all species that have ever lived are now extinct. Oh, that's sad. I mean, maybe, but that's just how it is. Um, so extinctions have occurred continuously throughout the history of Earth. All right. Um, the law of succession also provides us evidence of uh, change over time. So early scientists had made the observation that fossil species are very similar to living species in the same geographic area, right? So, um, you know, if you're, I don't know, in Asia and you're finding fossils near the seashore, they're going to look very much like um, Asian sea, you know, intertidal sea creatures that currently exist, right? And so this pattern um, of living things being similar to dead things in the same area was known as the law of succession. And so Darwin interpreted this pattern as evidence that the species had changed over time, that the fossils eventually changed um, and became the modern species that are alive right now, right? But the fact that the, the species from the past and then the present in the same area look more similar to each other than in another area um, gives you some evidence that the modern species are descended from the ancestors that were in the same place. All right, you guys, have you ever heard of the term missing link before? Yeah, I heard of that one before. All right, what's that? That's like when you insult somebody and say they look like a missing link. Okay, but what are they saying you look like? Like a caveman. Um, okay. So, what is a missing link then? Maybe it's something that's gone extinct. Okay. So why might missing links be important to understanding evolution? Well, like, maybe there are things that are like, like, in between the fossils and what's alive. Like, they're in between the two. Maybe they look like both. Yeah, that could be. And so how would that help us? That would that would help us know how we evolved to where we are now. Um, sort of. It would help us understand how our ancestors gave rise to species that are currently alive, right? Yeah. Okay, so we find, sometimes in the fossil record, transitional features. So these are traits in fossil species that are intermediate between the ancestral and the derived species. By derived, I mean something that occurs in modern times. And so these give us strong evidence for change over time. And one example of this would be, you can see if you look at a whole bunch of fossils of things that were um, kind of ancestors of the, the first tetrapods to come onto the land, um, we can see a gradual change from aquatic fin to terrestrial limb. So if we go back and we look at uh, Eusthenopteran, you can see that it had this big old meaty front flipper and very thickened bones, right? And the fin rays were quite short, so it was probably not a very strong swimmer, but maybe it was good at scrunching around on the bottom of the water, of the pond. We can look, um, so that Eusthenopteran was found around 385 million years ago. A little more recently, we can see Tiktaalik, and so Tiktaalik has even thicker, better developed bones up at the top here and down here, then that were oriented in this angle here so that it could kind of push around on the bottom, okay? Acanthostega had um, like a foot here and it had, it had so many toes. 
I mean, if you think about it, we could have all ended up with this many toes if things had gone a little differently in the past. Okay? And then to lerp to, to lerp a ton, um, had even <laughs> power outage. Okay, so Tularpaton was found even more recently, and Tularpaton had a proper leg, and it had many of the evident the bones that we we see in other kinds of tetrapods. All right, so we have kind of a transitional um, forms from um, older species to more recent species. All right, another kind of evidence that we have for evolution by natural selection involves vestigial traits. So when we say a vestigial trait, it is a reduced or incompletely developed structure that has either no function in the here and the now or a very reduced function compared to what it might have been in the past. And we compare, when we say no or reduced function, we mean in comparison to a functioning organ or structure in a closely related species. Um, so we have lots of examples of vestigial traits. One of them is that if you look at a snake or a whale, they have little tiny nubbins of hip and leg bones. They don't use those for walking, but those are leftover bits from the ancestor of the snake and the ancestor of the whale that was a walking animal. Okay, so the little nubbin is a vestigial leg, right, or a vestigial hip. Um, flightless birds still have wings, but they're just reduced. So if you look at something like a, an ostrich, they still got little flappy wings. They don't fly with them, but they still exist. So those are vestigial. Um, in something like a cave dwelling fish, they live in complete darkness, so they can't see. So they have no eyes, but they still have the bone structures that they had, in, well, that, they, that their ancestors had when they had eyes. So you can see these vestigial eye sockets. And then if you look at humans, we have all sorts of vestigial traits. Well, I guess most animals probably do, but we're really into ourselves, so we're, we're likely to notice all of our vestigial traits. Um, one of them is, if you kind of feel the base of your spine, you can feel you have these little, little bony bumps, and so that's the coccyx, and this is our evidence of a vestigial tail. So in our ancestors, like a spider monkey, our tail had many segments here like this that were well-developed and we could do things with our tail. Um, but instead, we have relatively few segments, and they are fused together like this. Um, another feature that humans have, you know how we get goosebumps when we're scared? This is something that is a vestigial trait in our ancestors that had hair all over their bodies. Like me! Yeah, like you. Um, if you get cold, you can kind of raise up the hairs, and it is produces um, some warmth. But it doesn't really do anything when we do that, um, because we don't have enough hair for it to make a difference. All right, so the existence of vestigial traits um, are inconsistent with the idea of special creation. So if each species is created separately and is supposed to be perfect the way it is, why would we have all this stuff? Um, second, vestigial traits are evidence that characteristics of species have changed over time, right? Okay, uh, name another example of a vestigial trait. I got one. Yeah? What is it? Like, when I go to sleep, as a dog, I get this, like, thing that goes over my eye, sort of. Yeah? And what is that? That's a third eyelid. Yeah, it's a third eyelid. Um, but it doesn't really work, right? No, it only goes part of the way over my eye. Yeah. Humans have even worse, right? We just have a little kind of pink bump at the kind of corner of our eye. All right, that's one thing. What else? Um, well, I got some more pictures here. What's this one here? Yeah, that's teeth. Teeth are dumb. Well, okay, as a bird, you probably don't use teeth, but which teeth are those? Oh, those are the, the wisdom teeth. Yeah, wisdom teeth, right? So we don't need those most of the time we get them pulled out, or they don't even erupt in a lot of people. And then what's this one here? Oh, yeah, that's your ears. Yeah, that's your ears. I always wondered why you guys had ears. They don't really do anything. They don't really turn, and you can't do anything with them. Yeah. Okay. All right, let's get some other examples of change through time. So um, we can actually see change happening in the here and the now. 
okay? So for example, um, we can see bacteria evolving resistance to drugs that we're using to try and kill the bacteria. We can see insects evolving resistance to pesticides. We can see weeding, weedy plants evolving resistance to herbicides that we're putting on them. And we can also see things like um, as climate change is, um, we see that it affects bird migration when insects emerge from you know, the ground or from their eggs, and also when flowering plants bloom. So those are all examples of change through time that we can actually see in our own lifetimes. So this gives us evidence that species are dynamic, right? That they change. Um, so they're not um, fixed, right? Or unchanging. Okay, another kind of evidence that we have for evolution comes from homology. So homology is defined as similarity that exists in species descended from a common ancestor, okay? So we'll give some examples of that. Um, so homology can be recognized and studied at three interacting levels, the, the level of genetic homology, developmental homology, and structural homology. So genetic homology means a similarity in DNA nucleotide sequences, or RNA nucleotide sequences, or amino acid sequences, right? And for, because these sequences were inherited from a common ancestor. All right, so if we compare this particular gene, uh, the gene is called aniridia, um, in humans, and there's a very similar gene. We gave it a different name in flies. I think a lot of times we find these genes in different groups and they, we name them separately and, and then realize later they're the same thing. But anyway, these are the same gene in humans and in fruit flies. Um, and if you look here, these letters are representing, each letter represents a different amino acid, okay? Um, so this is representing the proteins in humans and flies. And you can see that only the red letters are different, the rest are the same. So the sequences are 90% identical to one another, okay? The reason they're identical is because humans and, and flies inherited this gene sequence from a common ancestor, okay? Developmental homology is what you see in embryos of different species, so it's similarities seen in embryos of different species due to common ancestry. So if you look at the tails and the gill pouches um, in the embryos of chickens, humans, and cats, right, you can see that they're very similar. So for example, um, a chicken, a human, and a cat all have a tail, right? Uh, humans will lose the tail as they grow up, right? But the cat and the chicken will keep the tail. Um, the gill pouches in the side of the neck, right? We all have those because we inherited them all from our fish-like ancestor, right? Um, so this is the explanation for these embryonic similarities. It's the idea that we look similar to these other species because we inherited these similarities from a common ancestor. Um, and that common ancestor had gill pouches and a tail, right? All right, structural homology is a third kind of homology, and that is a similarity in adult morphology due to um, the fact that you inherited this trait from a common ancestor. So in most vertebrates, they have the same common structural plan in the limbs. All right, they have a humerus, this bone over in the back, right? So all these, and if you like track the, you know, the growth um, as embryos, you can see that these are created from the same clump of cells. Um, so we know that this is the same bone in a human, a horse, a bird, a bat, and a seal, the radius and ulna, right? We all have that. We have the carpals in the wrist here, the metacarpals, and then the phalanges, right? So the reason why all of these different species have the same um, limb bones is because we inherited them from our common ancestor, right? Some kind of little salamander guy crawling around who had those limb bones. All right, so let's review. What's a homology? It's a similarity. It is a similarity. Um, why is it similar? Because you get it from a common ancestor. Yes, you get it from a common ancestor. All right, so name and describe the three kinds of homologies that we talked about. Oh, oh, I got one. It's a genetic homology. Yeah, good job, bird. A genetic homology. So what is a genetic homology? It's like, you know, the DNA or the RNA or the amino acids are the same because it was the same in the ancestor. Yeah. Yep, that's it. What's another kind of homology? Structural. Wow, who are you? Don't ask. 
Okay. What's a structural homology? It's a similarity in the adult form because of a common ancestor, like the number of fingers you got. Yep, that's right. We have five fingers, and a mouse has five fingers, right? Um, because our ancestor had five fingers. Okay. And so what is the third kind of a homology? It's a developmental homology. Yeah. What's a developmental homology? It's like something when you're like a gross little embryo that's the same because you got it from your common ancestor. Yeah, that's what it is. Okay. Um, the levels of homology can interact with one another. So if you have a genetic homology, it can, can cause developmental homology. It's observed in embryos, right? So if you have if two different species have the same stretch of DNA because they have the same common ancestor, that can cause them to develop in exactly the same way, right? So their embryos look the same. Um, if you have developmental homology, meaning if, the, for example, the timing or which clumps of cells become what, you know, in the embryo, that can lead to structural homologies in the adults. So the fact that um, embryos of like a cat and a human develop um, so that they have five little finger nubbins and then adults will have five fingers, right? Um, that's a developmental homology leading to a structural homology. And we consider the genetic code. Do you guys remember what the genetic code is? Yeah, it's how like, it's how the RNA codes for the different amino acids. Yeah. So that's the most fundamental homology because Nearly all living organisms will use the same genetic code for translating the language of DNA into RNA into proteins, right? So um, you can take the same sequence of RNA and it will be made into the same proteins whether you're doing it in a bacteria or a human. All right, so our fruit flies and mouse, uh, fruit fly eyes and mouse eyes, um, are the genes homologous? This is a question people were really very curious about because the eye of a fruit fly is very different than a mouse eye. A fruit fly eye is a compound eye made up of a bunch of little tiny simple eyes versus a mouse eye, which is, um, it's not compound, it's a single eye, um, and it's, it works a lot differently, okay? Um, so people didn't used to think that the, the genes that code for the fruit fly eye and the mouse eye were homologous. However, um, if you took a fruit fly embryo and put genes that express the mouse eye genes into, for example, just somewhere on the fly's leg, you would get a little fruit fly eye there. So you put a mouse gene into, you know, you have like a little growing embryo of a, um, of a fly, you know, a little, I don't know, little egg, little pre-maggot, right? If you go and insert the gene into the part of the body of the leg, that leg will grow an eye. Um, and because the machinery to make an eye in the fly is different than the machinery to make an eye in a mouse, the eye that gets made is a fly eye, okay? So this mouse gene is expressed as a fly eye on the leg. Um, another thing is that because of molecular homologies, so meaning that because the DNA is, is similar in lots of organisms, model organisms can be used in medical research. Um, so you can use like DNA from a yeast to explore a disease in humans. Um, so the theory of evolution by natural selection predicts that homologies will occur. So um, if you, you might expect that you would have similarities in structures and in DNA if the species are related to each other. However, if the species were created independently of one another, you would not expect these kind of similarities to occur. So again, this is a piece of evidence that is consistent with evolution and not consistent with special creation. All right, so we're going to talk a lot about speciation in this course, but to define it, speciation is a process that results in one species splitting into two or more descendant species. And we have been able to document lots and lots and lots of contemporary, meaning here and now, populations that are in the process of undergoing speciation. And so the fact that we can actually see speci speciation in action is very powerful evidence that the existing species are descendants of species that have lived in the past. It also supports the idea that all organisms are related by descent from a common ancestor, right? So if you looked at um, every single organism, you can figure out 
um, where it came from, and if you kind of go backwards and backwards and backwards in time, you will find that all life is related by a single common ancestor. All right, so here's just a summary slide of all the things we just talked about. Um, so this is kind of sorting it out by what it's evidence of. So the first prediction that we made is that species were not static and that species change over time, right? And so the prediction was that the Earth is very old, not just 6,000 years old, and this is confirmed by the fossil record. Second, that fossil extinct species will resemble living species found in the same area. We definitely see that. The existence of transitional features that document changes through time. Vestigial traits, we, we see them all over the place. Um, we find that characteristics of populations vary within species and also can be observed changing in the here and the now. All right, our second prediction was that the species are related to one another. Each species is not an independent um, lineage unrelated to anything else. And one piece of evidence of that is that similar species will often live in the same geographic area. Right. Um, the second is that homologous traits are common and are recognized at the level of genetic homology, developmental homology, and structural homology. And also that you can actually see new species being formed today from pre-existing species. All right, um, let's talk about the idea of internal consistency too. So data from independent sources agree in their support of predictions made by a, th of a theory, right? So a theory that's well supported should be internally consistent. Um, so evidence, I'll just give you an example here of internal consistency in the theory of evolution, looking at cetaceans. So what's a cetacean? It's a whale. Yeah, it's a whale. Um, so the idea that cetaceans have evolved in a particular way um, can be found to be internally consistent. So for example, you can find fossil cetaceans because they have very, very unique, they have unique ear bones. And if we create a phylogeny or an evolutionary history of cetaceans, we can find that there's a gradual transition between terrestrial, terrestrial organisms and aquatic organisms. So if you do a DNA comparison, comparing a hippo and lots of other living mammals to cetaceans, we find that hippos are the closest living relatives of cetaceans um, and that they, they likely share a semi-aquatic ancestor, okay? Um, and if you look at um, vestigial hip and limb bones, in some, you can see that they exist in some adult whales and dolphins, um, including in the embryos of those. So we can see here, this is a, what's it? This is a hippo. And so these are different kinds of ancestors of cetaceans. So we can see that in the fossil record, we have stuff that's a little bit whaley looking, um, but it can walk around on its legs. This guy probably could just paddle around. It couldn't support weight on its legs. This guy had a little tiny front leg um, and was missing its, its hind limbs, but still had a little vestigial hind limb. And then here we have a proper um, living uh, what do you call it, modern whale, and it's got flippers and no hind limbs, okay? So this gives us fossil evidence of how we may have gotten from a hoofed semi-aquatic ancestor to a whale, okay? Um, so there's internal consistency in what we see in the fossil record and what we see in the DNA. All right, um, not just for cetaceans, but for many, many different animals and plants and everything else, Data from lots of different sources are consistent with evolution. They are not consistent with special creation. So we have internal consistency to support the idea of evolution. Um, descent with modification is a more successful and powerful scientific theory than the theory of special creation because it can explain things like vestigial traits and homologies. Um, and so I just want to bring up this idea here. Did you guys no. Did Charles Darwin invent the idea of evolution? Well, I thought he did, but if you're asking, I'm guessing the answer is probably no. Well, that, that's good thinking there. You are correct. The answer is no. He didn't invent the idea of evolution. There's lots of previous researchers that have proposed that evolution occurred. And so what Darwin did that added to things is he described a process that could explain the pattern of descent with modification. So he just, he, people had seen the pattern, right, of evolution before Darwin, but Darwin described the process by which evolution occurred. 
And that process is called natural selection. So Darwin combined several ideas to arrive at his idea of natural selection. Um, he first made observations about artificial selection. So he, we'll talk about that in a second, but he saw that people choose animals and plants with very particular traits. And so over generation after generation, um, the certain traits become more common and others become less common. Second, he read Malthus's struggle for existence in natural populations. And in this book, it described how in it, you know, when, when times are tough, everyone in a particular generation may not survive with only some surviving. And third, Darwin had observed variation in natural uh, populations. So he was a naturalist, he collected lots of organisms, and he found that they didn't all look the same, they varied. So here's artificial selection. So in Darwin's time, Darwin wasn't like some weird pigeon weirdo or whatever. I mean, not that somebody who likes pigeons is a pigeon weirdo, you know, likes, but not likes likes, you know what I mean. But um, people do breed pigeons now. Um, so you can go see fancy pigeons if you go to like a 4-H club um, or other kinds of clubs. But in Darwin's time, everybody was breeding pigeons. It was like the thing to do. All of the gentlemen were out there breeding their pigeons, making fancy, fancy pigeons like this. And so Darwin did this too. He crossbred pigeons and he observed how the characteristics were passed on to offspring. Um, we know that all of the different kinds of pigeon breeds are all descended from those wild pigeons that you just find walking around the street, okay? Um, so that's artificial selection, right? So that's um, some individuals, um, in this case pigeons, doing better than others um, because people preferred them. Okay, um, the second inspiration was Thomas Robert Malthus's an essay on the principle of population, and it described that, that people were basically in a struggle for existence. Many more people were born than could survive, and so people had to compete very seriously for resources. I mean, it's kind of a modern tragedy, and it was a tragedy in Darwin's time as well. Um, we should, at this point, mention Alfred Russell Wallace. So Alfred Russell Wallace had a similar idea to Darwin, but we tend to think of Darwin's name instead of Alfred Russell Wallace's, okay? Um, for a couple of reasons. <coughs> the first one is that Darwin really did think of it first. So the way that the two men have become linked together with this idea was Darwin had the idea of evolution by natural selection and he started collecting evidence to support this. He had evidence and evidence and evidence and evidence and evidence and evidence. He kept collecting more and more evidence. He was maybe stalling publishing on the origin of species because his wife's family was very religious and he thought that probably bad things would happen to him once he published this book. So he really stalled on that. He did not want to publish the book. So he hung on to it for a long time, adding more and more and more evidence. Um, one of his colleagues, Alfred Russell Wallace, at one point wrote him a letter and he's like, hey, Chucky e. D, I have this great idea. And he wrote a little letter and the letter basically summarized the theory of evolution by natural selection. And since Darwin was kind of a gentleman, he didn't say, he didn't do anything to, to crush Wallace. He instead said, oh, you know what? I have the same idea. Let's both present our data at this academic conference at the same time. So they did. And so um, basically that is why we say that Darwin and Wallace had had kind of the same idea at the same time, even though Darwin is credited with the idea because he was the one who brought the evidence. Okay. All right. So Darwin broke the process of evolution by natural selection into four postulates. The first postulate is that individuals in a population vary in their traits, right? Everyone is different. The second is that some of these differences are heritable, meaning they can be genetically inherited and passed on to offspring. The third is that in each generation, a lot more offspring are going to be made that can actually live to adulthood. So only some of them are going to survive long enough to reproduce. Also, for the ones that survive long enough to reproduce, some of them will have a lot of babies and some of them not so many. The fourth postulate is that individuals with certain inherited, inherited or heritable traits are more likely to survive and reproduce. So natural selection occurs when individuals with certain traits produce more offspring than do individuals without those traits, okay? And so the, the word selected um, is kind of a reference to the idea that the environment is choosing which individuals survive and which individuals die, right? 
um, it's choosing them by the individuals that have the characteristics to survive in the environment are selected and the other ones die. This is kind of a term like artificial selection. So in artificial selection, people are choosing which individuals live and die, but in natural selection, the environment is choosing who lives and who dies, okay? All right, so the trait that is selected by the environment will increase in frequency in the population from one generation to the next causing evolution, okay? So the trait that does better in the environment Right? Those individuals will have more babies, right? so that trait will be passed on more to the next generation. So you will see evolution change over time. Right? In the, you know, over time, you get more and more and more individuals who have the trait that helps them survive and reproduce. Okay? All right, so evolution is basically just a logical outcome if you follow those four postulates. So if, if everything happens according to the four postulates, you have to end up with evolution or change over time. Um, so we can condense Darwin's four steps into just two statements. Evolution by natural selection occurs when heritable variation leads to differential reproductive success. Heritable, meaning it's a genetically based variation, and it leads to differential, meaning differences amongst individuals, reproductive success, right? Natural selection occurs when some individuals have inherited traits that allow them to reproduce better and have more babies than other individuals. All right, we've got a couple of definitions here before um, <clears throat> we stop this part of the lecture. The first is fitness. So when I say fitness, I mean the ability of an individual to produce surviving fertile offspring. And fitness, like how do you even know like how fit is fit enough, right? You're gonna compare the fitness of one individual to the ability of other individuals in the population to provide surviving fertile offspring, okay? Second definition, adaptation. So an adaptation is a heritable trait that increases an individual's fitness in a particular environment relative to individuals lacking that trait. So um, fitness refers to an ability to produce surviving fertile offspring relative to others. Adaptation is the trait itself, and adaptation is what allows you to live in that environment. Selection refers to different differential reproduction as the result of heritable variation. So it's basically what I just showed you in the previous slide, okay? All right, so what's differential reproduction as a result of heritable variation? Selection! Yeah, selection. What is the ability of an individual to produce surviving fertile offspring relative to the ability of other individuals in the population? It's fitness! Yeah, fitness. What is a heritable trait that increases an individual's fitness in a particular environment relative to individuals lacking that trait? Oh, it's an adaptation. Yeah, an adaptation. All right. Well, I think this is where I'm going to stop for today. And so then you can join me for part two of the lecture coming soon.